We're going to begin a section where we look at suing the federal government for damages, some of which are from tort-like injuries, some of which are from takings. This is different than the usual look at suing the government in administrative law, which focuses on injunctions and other processes to stop agency action or to force agency action. Before we can sue the government, we have to look at sovereign immunity. Sovereign immunity is an old concept that comes from the common law, the notion the king could do no wrong. It really reflected the power that the king had and that there really was no judicial process that could reach the king. The United States Constitution doesn't put it in terms of the immunity of the sovereign, but really it's terms of protecting the United States government's budget. It's uh, in the Appropriations Clause of the Constitution, Article 1, Section 9, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. The courts have construed this since the earliest days as creating sovereign immunity. By sovereign immunity, we mean that you can't sue the government for money. The Fifth Amendment, part of the Bill of Rights, modifies the Appropriations Clause by creating a right to sue the government for damages in the case of a takings. And we remember that from the Fifth Amendment, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So this creates a constitutional right to compensation with the government takes property. This overrides the limits of the Appropriation Clause. While the Fifth Amendment created a right to compensation in, if the government took your property, it didn't provide any mechanism to pay for that compensation or to evaluate your claim. Originally, Congress would pass private bills to compensate people for damages for takings and other government actions. Private bills are legislation that has to pass through bicameralism and presentment and it awards specific money damages to private individuals or other legal entities. Originally, Congress both determined the merit of the claim and the amount of compensation, and then passed a bill that would pay that claim. As you might imagine, this was open for graft and corruption. It was also an inexact way to determine compensation. It's also likely that unless you had friends in Congress, you would probably never get your private bill through the congressional process. Congress recognized that the private bill process was a mess. It was inefficient, it was subject to graft, and even when it worked, it took a long time to compensate people. Congress evaluated what it might do to change this system and determined that it could waive sovereign immunity. The process for doing this would be to appropriate a pool of money that could be used to pay judgments and then to set up an adjudication process to determine which claims were valid and how much they should be paid. The courts have ruled that these sort of laws that waive sovereign immunity should be construed very narrowly. This is termed laws that are derogation of immunity, meaning just that it limits immunity, but the courts are suspicious of these because the Constitution establishes a baseline of immunity. The court is, will allow Congress to create causes of action under the Constitution, but if a claimant doesn't fall exactly under the terms of the statute, they will fall back to immunity and their claim will fail. So in 1855, Congress set up an administrative tribunal to regularize the private bill process. The Court of Claims, which has been renamed the Court of Federal Claims, was established to mostly hear takings claims, 
uh, and some other types of claims that were added later on to determine through an adjudication process that looks like a trial uh, the validity of the claims and the amount of money that should be paid in the takings. The Court of Claims, now the Federal, the Court of Federal Claims is not an Article III court. It's an Article I court. It's like a bankruptcy court. Like the bankruptcy courts, the judges serve fixed terms. For the Court of Federal Claims, it's a 15-year term. Uh, the status of the court was tested in early litigation over Congress's ability to lower the salary of the judges during their term. The court found that the salaries could be lowered, which can't be done for Article III courts, and established the status of the courts. The judges, judgments of the Court of Claims and the Court of Federal Appeals now are appealed to the Federal Circuit, and from the Federal Circuit, they are appealed to the United States Supreme Court. The original jurisdiction of the Court of Federal Claims was for just compensation for the taking of private property, uh, disputes over the refund of federal taxes, disputes over military and civilian pay allowances, and damages for breach of contracts with the government. The court could only award money damages, does not have the power to enjoin government behavior. If you want to enjoin the government behavior to stop an agency action or force an agency action, then that will bring us back into the administrative law realm and the Article III courts. Scholars have attacked sovereign immunity for a very long time. This attack comes from both the right and the left, and it is based on the concern that the government should not have the unlimited power to injure its citizens and not be answerable to the courts for that. The traditional policy rationale for sovereign immunity is the need for the government to be able to make hard decisions. An example of this is conscription for military service, which has been upheld by the courts. As we'll see later on with the litigation over the Federal Tort Claims Act, that the government can even do actions which it knows will injure citizens or put them at risk and still be accorded sovereign immunity. The jurisprudential rationale is separation of powers. The legislature really should be able to make the decisions on what are appropriate policies and powers for the federal government carried out through the executive branch and determine the legal li the financial liability of the government. This should not be left to the courts. The Court of Federal Claims was designed to deal primarily with takings plus the salary disputes, the tax refunds, and essentially contract, contract issues with the federal government. It did not include any compensation for negligent or intentional tort injuries. The takings clause itself does not include accidents to property. So if a postal service truck runs into your car and totals it, that's not considered a taking, although you might argue that the government has destroyed your property. The taking must be an intentional part of a government policy. Now, if the government policy uh, and project, such as a flood control project, results in your house being flooded because it's behind the spillway of a new dam or in a new river channel, then while the government may not have intended to take your property, it has effectively taken it through its policy measures and that can be a taking. There is also some jurisprudence that temporary damage to property can constitute a taking of at least some of the value of the property. These are very limited exceptions. In general, you can't turn a tort claim into a taking claim by bringing it into the Court of Federal Claims. These are some concepts that you should now be familiar with on sovereign immunity. 
uh, from both reading of materials and our short discussion of this, we're not going to really be looking deeply into sovereign immunity. It's important to understand that it exists, and if you fall outside of the Federal Tort Claims Act, then your claims will fail because of sovereign immunity.